Welcome to this seminar on an innovative citizen science approach for paleontology research, date a fossil. My name is Tara Jokic and I'm a geoscientist with the Australian Museum located in Sydney, New South Wales. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waterways on which the museum is located, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to start by introducing the Data Fossil team. We are a highly diverse team coming from across a number of Australian uh, research institutions, including the Australian Museum, the Queensland Museum, and also the University of Canberra. Before I get started on the detail of the project itself, it's worth outlining the origins of the Data Fossil project. As with many scientific endeavours, this project began with an unexpected discovery. In 2018, Matthew and Michael, our team leads, had been investigating fossils in some iron rich rocks from a newly found site called McGrath's Flat. To do this, they were using high resolution imaging known as scanning electron microscopy, or SEM. During one of Michael's SEM sessions, he discovered fossilized pollen in the rock sample. Now, ancient pollen is well known to aid researchers in both dating rocks and reconstructing the ancient environment. Now, traditionally, pollen has been extracted from rocks by dissolving them in acid. However, this method is typically restricted to rocks that are one, easy to dissolve, and two, do not contain iron. So when the pollen was observed in this SEM image, it came as a surprise. And it was the first time that pollen has been imaged in rocks rather than recovered by acid. This unexpected di discovery of pollen meant we had a way to both date the rocks and understand more about the past environment. But it was realized that there were some limitations. Firstly, this type of microscope work is very time consuming and can be costly. And there is a bit of an observation bias as larger pollen, more than smaller specimens would be noticed by a single observer. To solve these problems, we teamed up with the Center for Advanced Microscopy at ANU to have relatively large areas, and by large, I mean only a couple of centimeters square of the rock sampled to produce thousands and thousands of high resolution SEM images. And it was thought to invite volunteers to identify these pollen in the images. This is how Data Fossil was born. This solved the time and cost limitation posed by SEM work and would allow more detailed observation of the data. And it was also a chance to increase the public participation in paleontology research, which historically has been difficult to do. Once the images were acquired, we teamed up with Digivolt, an online citizen science platform established in 2012 by the Australian Museum in partnership with the Atlas, Atlas of Living Australia. With Digivolt, we created an online workflow for the Data Fossil Project, where volunteers could transcribe SEM images and help ID fossil pollen and spores from the tens of thousands of SEM images. To give you a brief idea of the data fossil method, it involved firstly uploading the SEM images into the Digivolt platform. These were divided into 28 expeditions, each with 600 or 1,000 images. A call out for new and existing Digivolt volunteers were allowed to register and they were given a step-by-step -step guide, a pollen ID chart and the transcription protocol. Overall, we ended up having 271 volunteers. It took about three to four days for the volunteers to complete an expedition. And overall, all, all 25,000 images were transcribed in about three months. The volunteers collectively identified 94 pollen and spores, 33 unknown microfossils, and they flagged over 3,000 possible occurrences of microfossil data. Validity checks were put in place to verify the ID made by volunteers. So a three volunteer system was used, which meant that pollen, a pollen specimen would essentially be validated only if three volunteers agreed on its identification. 
Further validity checks involved the research staff to look over the data flagged by the volunteers. And eventually we had a, paleo a palynologist cross check any IDs that were uncertain. From this data, over 400 pollen and spores have been identified from the 25,000 SEM images in just the area of 1.85 centimeters square. As these are preliminary findings, I'll briefly discuss the results with respect to the strengths and weaknesses of this approach for both paleontology research and enhancing public participation in paleontology studies. So firstly, this does reduce staff costs, if anything, from research time browsing the tens of thousands of images. It's also an effective use of the SEM image, uh, instrument, which we can run overnight and on weekends as it's an automated setup. And it's a generating large quantitative data sets. And there's also less collection bias as there are more eyes to observe the high resolution images. On the other hand, ID still needs someone to sort and expertly verify all of the possible microfossils identified. From a citizen science point of view, Digivol is a free uh, platform and engages thousands of volunteers. So there's a plethora of uh, engaged volunteers to be able to do this work already existing. Paleontology research is now more accessible to citizen scientists using this method as previously it hasn't been as accessible particularly because field work uh, requires people to, you know, get out into the field as opposed to something such as this, which we can do all online. And the Data Fossil Project is fun and it provides a diverse fossil assemblage. So the volunteers aren't just looking at one or two different fossils of the same thing and having to just troll through the same images and ID the same pollen over and over again. In fact, there are many different types of uh, geological and biological features that they might come across, including the pollen, so the two uh, pollen and spores at the top there, um, possibly microbial structures, uh, mineral structures, uh, algae, and even um, acrotox, which are a sort of an unknown fossil, but really interesting st structures to look at. On the other hand, we with the Digivol platform, there are still limitations. Um, obviously an internet connection is used and it's project specific. So there's uh, all these limitations around project specificity because the platform um, may not have all the flexibility available to the project. Although in this case, it did prove to be very, very useful. Lastly, I'll just go over some of the outcomes and future directions of the project. So uh, some of the outcome, outcomes include an increased data set of biostratigraphic data used to age McGrath's flat. Now this can be applied to similar uh, locations. Next steps might also include uh, the use of AI or machine learning to identify the fossils and compare that to the efficacy of citizen science identification and even expert ID. We are deriving now a bank of pollen and spore specimen data. And we can apply this type of thing to other microfossils. So we might be able to essentially generate a depository of data of uh, flora and fauna that exist in this site. And we can also use this data to investigate the paleoecology. So looking at the more ecosystem dynamics based on what assemblages of flora and fauna we're seeing. This may also generate commercially valuable data sets, such as those used to understand the age of rocks when looking for mineral resources, for example, and developing citizen science approaches for paleontology research. So increasing public involvement in paleontology research, which again has historically been difficult to do, and also imp improve scientific literacy in this discipline of study. So fossil knowledge is rare, um, and it's a potential, uh, it gives us the potential to measure maybe improvements in volunteer knowledge due to their engagement in a study like this. And lastly, the data fossil method might actually stimulate development of microscope technology. So better programs for autofocusing on non-polished surfaces would be, um, would be something that might come about from a project like this and to improve the acquisition speed and image quality of large data sets. 
um, knowing that these data sets can be used in a, a very efficient and beneficial way. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this talk. I'll just leave some acknowledgements up on the screen here and particularly want to um, thank the Robert Etheridge family descendants for supporting this work and the Australian Museum, both the Research Institute and the Foundation. Thanks so much and I'll be happy to take questions.